its own body. Not only disgusting, probably physically impossible, I would say. You give up the business? <laughs> I'm going to tell myself off. When Simon Callow and Stephen Fry visited Norwich, they offered their combined talents to help raise funds for the city's medieval cathedral. Ten million pounds was needed to extend the historic library, build a new choir school, and enlarge the visitor's center. This 900-year-old treasure was to be made relevant to the 21st century and beyond. Seven million pounds had been raised in just three years, and Norwich's Theatre Royal was packed with cathedral supporters who wanted to hear what Callow and Fry had to say about life, art, and everything. As theatre director, my part was to ensure they reached the stage on time. Simon and Stephen are shortly going to be pushed on stage for the first of the two halves of the season's entertainment. Now, in the Theatre Royal's annual pantomime, the good fairy always enters and exits stage right. <laughs> and the evil fairy always enters and exits stage left. So, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, mums and dads, Simon Callow and Stephen Fry. My goodness, my lords, my ladies, my lord bishop, um, Stephen Fry, Simon <laughs> Callow. Um, we thought we'd begin this evening talking a bit about Norwich, and uh, I thought I'd ask Simon, who is not, as I am, proudly a Norvikensian, um, to ask why someone who was educated in London and Northern Ireland should give up a valuable Sunday to come and support Norwich Cathedral? Well, I'm a, I'm a, a recent convert to Norwich um, because I've only very recently come here and it literally, as I came from the station in the taxi and turned sort of twice or three times and suddenly found myself faced with St. Peter Mancroft and saw, or began to see the astonishing richness of architecture that there is in this city. Uh, and was fascinated to see that St. Peter Mancroft is absolutely next to the marketplace itself. And that all the street names seem to be celebrating markets of one sort or another. And I saw immediately Madder Market, you know, instantly. Uh, uh, one was in, almost, in Shakespeare's world. And um, as I got to know the, the, the churches, the cathedrals, the, the extraordinary buildings, the byways, the back streets, the graveyards, and so on, I, I began to feel that, that somehow in this world, this world was, in a way, this, this was the embodiment. Norwich itself was the embodiment of what, um, what we sort of mean by Western civilization. That's, that's a, a, a rather general and an emotional uh, <laughs> uh, uh, analysis, uh, to put it mildly. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, for that I honor it and, 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 and would seek to do anything I could to maintain and support this great tradition. Yes. Well, that's, a, that's probably the highest doctrine of Norwich I've ever heard. I mean, <laughs> fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. I was going to say, because I like the mustard. <laughs> <laughs> Think of something a little classier now. <laughs> um, there's a famous quotation about Norwich, which is from um, Ben Johnson in, uh, I think it's in Bartholomew Fair, isn't it? Where, uh, which would argue that maybe it is not just for you that Norwich typifies Western society, but even for those um, rather gruesome and chilling people who wish to see Western 
society defeated. It always did. There's a phrase, Lon- um, Sodom, Gomorrah, London and Norwich. Um, <laughs> and I've spent a long time looking for that aspect of Norwich. And, um, not much luck. Um, though Burr Street can hum sometimes. Uh, it's, uh, you, you were actually born where? I was born in Norfolk's own Hampstead. Uh, <laughs> So, to my, uh, to my shame, I'll never be able to call myself a true Norfolk dumpling, but uh, I moved here when I was seven. Not on my own. My parents actually uh, uh, <laughs> came too, um, and uh, they're still here, and I've had a place for the last 20 years almost right. uh, in Norfolk on my own, um, and I come back here whenever I can. You went to school here? Um, North Walsham. <laughs> always gets a laugh in Norfolk. It's a bit like saying New Jersey in America or <laughs> Neesden. It is the Neesden of Norfolk, perhaps, North Ocean. Um, it has its lovely spots, um, uh, and it has the Paston School, an old grammar school. Um, it's, it was quite a long way from, from where I grew up, which is a little village uh, called Booton, um, um, not really close to anywhere. Reefham is the nearest um, village, I suppose. And so it involved quite a collection of bus journeys to get from Booton to North Walsham uh, by way of a small town called Aylsham, uh, which had a little cafe in the market where there was a pinball machine. And that became um, my solace of an idle hour, really. I just played pinball a lot instead of making the little further extra journey to North Walsham. And they, <laughs> they grew a little tired of that. You see the downward slope of our hero, don't you? It's too terrible. Um, um, what, what, how, how does Tennyson put it? Uh, rose on the stepping stones of my dead self to higher things um, and went to the Norwich City College by this time, um, which was the saviour. What about you? You, you went to school at uh, a school you don't have much fondness for, didn't you? Well, um, I, I, I went to a, a, an extraordinary variety of schools in the early days. I, I was uh, born in South London, mm-hmm. in Streatham, and then was transferred to the country side when my mother became school secretary at a place called Goring on Thames. And, and first of all, I was a little shocked as a suburban How old child. are you at this point? Five. Oh. A, a little shocked at, at, at the countryside, uh, yeah. which was a... Uh, I mean, Streatham doesn't have a lot of countryside. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we, of course, were in the school. It, it was run by a chap with, with the wonderfully evil and warlike name of Roland Birch. For a, headmaster, an admirable name, <laughs> and indeed he lived well up to his name. He was very fond of the, a flick of the, the tours, um, and uh, um, he had a mother, a mother who was ever-present, uh, a, a, a lovely hirsute, <laughs> fat old body. <laughs> Roland Birch and his mother, as a sideline, um, had battery hens and some mischievous person had gone in and opened all the doors of the, uh, the, of the, the little battery batteries, yeah. cells and uh, um, I was accused of this crime and there was a tremendous and uh, very um, emotional scene It never leaves you, injustice is the primary emotion the young feel, yes. smarting at injustice yes the worst thing. Exactly. It? I, I, I think in the end I was, I was uh, vindicated, but, but, I, but I did feel uh, um, that I'd, um, wrong had been done. And your life ever since has been a quest to, to, to prove exactly. that you didn't... To the world, yeah. that I'm not an did you... egg destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> we, have the, uh, we have the master, Peter Wilson, has a bucket. Um, <laughs> filled with questions from the audience. So enter Peter Wilson with... Oh, a bucket. <laughs> How fantastic. How marvellous. <laughs> Look at this. You take one. All right. And I should take... We're taking them at random, so this could be very good. <clears throat> T.S. of... Um, row 14, um, not only disgusting, probably physically impossible, I would say. Um, <laughs> oh, no, I misread it. I mean. <laughs> this is a good question from someone called um, 
Tessa Stotzilas, Scotchilas, I'm sorry, uh, from Norwich. How have you decided to follow one direction in life over another? I, how have you decided to do what is right for you in life to do? And uh, I think we both have in, in common, uh, amongst many things, is that we do enjoy writing as much as we do acting, and we enjoy acting in different media. And uh, what did you set out to do? I set out, actually, funny enough, I talked about, uh, when I was at Cambridge, I thought, I wrote to the BBC, and I thought I would be absolutely at my happiest if, if I was given the job of being a continuity announcer. <laughs> if, um, it's, it's, it's two minutes past two, and Pat is having a crisis with the yogurts. Um, <laughs> and then that's the archers, and you'll be able to hear that edition at the same time tomorrow, or whatever, you know, all these things. That, that to me would be, that was enough. Right. I really thought that was enough, and I hoped if I was able to get a job as a continuity announcer, that I might be able to, to write plays secretly in the evenings when I was off duty um, and um, smuggle them to the, 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 the um, drama commissioner of, of, the, uh, of the BBC and maybe get a, a part in them. But that, that was it. But I always, knew, I always knew I'd write. I think that was... The writing is something you only need a pen and paper for or a typewriter when I was young or obviously a computer now. Um, and acting is something you can't do on your own, exactly. Yeah. Um, Excuse me? No, well, obviously, <laughs> but you still need, you need stage managers and you need, you know, you need an infrastructure and all the rest of it. Writing, you don't. So, yeah. so writing is the sort of primal urge, I think. But uh, yeah. is that what you find? Uh, absolutely. Uh, like you, I above all wanted to write. But unlike you, I had absolutely no conviction in my ability to do so. I, 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 I wrote... And I was appalled by what I wrote. I thought, this is, I have <laughs> nothing to say. This is absurd. And I'm saying it so boring. But I, but, but I worked oh, obsessively at it on that, that little Olympia typewriter that I had bought by selling all my LPs. That was how serious it yeah. was for me. Yeah. And uh, 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 of course I realized all I had to write about was me. And there was nothing less interesting yeah. to the world at large than me. So I just put that aside and thought one day maybe I'll find a subject and the odd irony of the thing was I became an actor and found my subject. You've written gosh knows how many books. How many? Five, six, seven, eight at least? Fourteen. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> you just haven't been keeping... That's astonishing. Oh, you. You? I'm so sorry. Some of them are quite small. <laughs> But that's even less of an excuse for you not to have read them since then. No, quite. <laughs> exactly. They've been around. Yeah. Oh, damn. I'm so sorry. Fourteen books. <laughs> yes. And only now do I think I'm on the brink of having the courage to actually invent something. Yeah. I've only ever been able to write about e existing matters, you know? Yes. Although I notice that my writing is aspiring more and more to the condition of fiction, which is a bit alarming if you're a biographer. <laughs> <laughs> you have to get a good check on that one, because you can start... You've cunningly chosen dead people. <laughs>Thinking, uh, when you were talking about Gilgood and uh, great actors, firstly I thought, because that's the way my cheap mind goes, in a Sherin-like way, of anecdotes, um, and I did hear one, it somehow seems to me to sum up all that's brightest and best of England, was, a, was an Edith Evans story. She bought a Renoir in, her, in, in, in the 1930s or 40s, when they were, even then, pretty expensive, and uh, a friend went to, to have tea with her, said, Edith, has your, uh, has your Renoir, has it come back from, from Christie's or some other place? She said, yes, yes. She said, can, can, can I have a look? She said, it's over there. And very low down, it was a sort of winter afternoon tea, so there was no, not much natural light, and the, the guest had to, to go all the way down like this and lift up a curtain to look at it, and got some light on it. She said, Edith, it's absolutely gorgeous, but why did you hang it there? And she said, there was a hook. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony Hopkins has a story about Olivier, while we're on the sub, whom he famously understudied for some time, and, uh, and Hopkins had to uh, had to go to uh, 
to a funeral. Some, someone, a like grandmother or something, had died, and uh, Olivier was running the company. And so he went. To, it was one afternoon after a matinee and before an evening performance. He knocked on his on the master's door, and Olivier said, "Come in." And uh, he said, uh, um, "Yeah, Larry, is it all right if I uh, go to Wales for his funeral?" He said, "My dear boy, of course you must go." And uh, so it was all right. He had the next day off whenever the funeral was. So he goes, collects his things, and <coughs> uh, he's just leaving the theatre for to have tea before the. Uh, and he hears Olivier's voice in his dressing room, going, "Of course you must go. Of course you <laughs> must go. You must go. Of course." <laughs> just rather pleasing, isn't it? <laughs> There's a story John Mills tells of uh, of Olivier, which I think is very extraordinary. Um, John Mills was just about Olivier's best friend, and uh, he gets a call. This is many years ago. Um, saying, Johnny, it's, it's Larry, I want you to come, you know it's my opening night tonight, I want you to come backstage and see me. And, uh, and they, he, he beetles off from, from Denham to, to, uh, to, to Waterloo Road, where um, uh, Olivier's performing, and he knocks on his door and says, come in. He says, Larry, uh, uh, what's the matter, what's the problem? He says, Johnny, I want you to know that what I'm about to do this evening is catastrophically terrible. I know it is. And I want you to tell my friends that I know it is, because I don't want them looking at me with sympathetic faces, not knowing how to tell me how dreadful what I'm about to do is. It is going to embarrass the hell out of you. And uh, Johnny said, oh, all right, I'll, I'll tell everybody. And he went round saying, look, it's not going to be great. Larry's, it's going to be ghastly. It's going to be the worst thing he's ever done, and he's very embarrassed. He just wants you to know that he knows that. So they all sit there nervously, and I'm going to stand up now just to warn the camera people, and he comes on back at the stage, he, oh, there's a door, opens it, comes up, and looks around, he closes the door, and he comes up, and he says, now is the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by the summer sun of York, and of course the performance by which all his other performances are measured, Richard III, it yes. was that first night, yes. and Johnny said, the moment he put his face into the stage through the door, before he'd even crossed the threshold, everybody knew they were one of the most magical evenings in the theatre they were ever likely to see. Yes. But the point is, he didn't know, and there's a, yes. Frank Finlay has a story similarly, when he played with, uh, with him in, uh, in Othello. There was one particular evening where he was so astonishing. Not only did he get a very, very rousing standing ovation, which was quite common, which went on forever, but the whole company just, well, just lost it and just cheered him, cheered him like that, and he stood there and he took it. Then when, when the curtain eventually came down, he stormed off and they heard him clattering down the stairs, slamming his dressing room door. They all looked at each other and Frank Finley was deputed to, uh, to go down and he knocked on the door, go away! He said, but uh, Larry, what's the matter? Go away! He said, don't you know you were brilliant tonight? Of course I... No, I was brilliant. I don't know why! <laughs> it's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs> but listen, now here's a question for you. Oh, well, at least it doesn't say it is, but I know it is. It says, it's actually a wanted notice. Wanted. Has anybody found a long-lost comedy show, A Chance in a Million, last seen decades ago? Nick Overy of Great Yarmouth. Now, A Chance in a Million, starring... Simon Caddo was 20 years ago broadcast exactly. on Channel 4. Indeed. Yeah. I, I don't know why this has happened, but this, it was a series which certainly has been seen by every taxi driver in London. Because <laughs> they always challenge me uh, uh, as to why it's not been seen. And um, I, what, one of them said to me once, uh, he said, uh, you haven't, uh, we haven't seen a lot of you on the telly since that uh, chance in a million, have we? So I said... <laughs> Well, I suppose not all that much. He said, so what happened? <laughs> yeah. said, Always uh, a mark of failure, it's considered. He said, you give up the business? <laughs> or did it give you up? No. <laughs> a bit of both, I said. No. <laughs> it's very <laughs> noble of you. <laughs> <It's very laughs> noble. Taxi drivers and I have a very uh, warm relationship. Yes, I sometimes think, taxi driver, that uh, I should have a series of cards to put up. Yes. So, as, as you, just as they're driving along, their mouth opens, you can put up a card saying, uh, no, there probably won't be another Blackadder, and then put that one down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they were damn good fun. And, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I like that one too. 
What's your question? Uh, it was for you, and are you going to read the new Harry Potter? I, I am going to do it. Yes, I'll do be doing it in a, in a week or so. HP5, as we inside this call. <laughs> uh, uh, which, which cracked the tiles of my porch the other morning. Um, <laughs> bloody woman. I'm doing... I'm proud to say I'm... Th- <laughs> On Thursday, I'm doing a thing a bit like this with her, funnily enough, at the Albert Hall. Uh-huh. Uh, the Albert with, Hall with thing. Thing. <laughs> I did have once um, the worst experience I've ever had of tripping over words. Um, sometimes, um, if I'm uh, kind of feeling good, I can go several pages without tripping up. Obviously, you know, you don't have to start at the very beginning again. You, you know, you have to go to the beginning of the, the sentence where you tripped up and, and re-record it. Um, but, you know, so I, can, sometimes, I can't remember what my record is, but I can get through quite a few pages then suddenly the words will start to swim in front of you. There was one phrase, three words. It took me, I swear to you, half an hour to get these three words out. Terribly simple, and I still can't say them, so I'm going to try and do it. It's Harry pocketed it. You see, I've done this again. (laughs) (laughs) Harry pocketed it. Harry pocketed it. And it went like this, Harry pocketed it. Oh, (laughs) Harry pocketed it. It went on and on and on and on. I was thinking I was going to have to separate the three, the three, just go, Harry and sort of look at my watch and pocketed <laughs> and then it would be like one of those you know, Stephen Hawking voice machines <laughs> so, so I'm hoping she hasn't written that again we've got time for I don't know how we're doing for time but I'm, I'm having fun at the moment obviously yes, we're, 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 we're storm out when you're bored <laughs> uh, that, was it, that one we're on overtime now. Yes, I think it's right saying that uh, boredom the word boredom was invented by Charles Dickens wasn't it it was first use really in the OED yeah good answer and did you know there's n- that the word gullible isn't in the OED? Why not? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a bit more wisdom. <laughs> well, indeed. Um, it's been fantastic. Um, um, what we're going to do now is go off and have a glass of water and I'm going to towel myself down because it's very warm here. Um, or as I heard um, that Virginia Wade say when she was um, doing tennis commentary a couple of years ago, she said, yes, a lot of players keep a, a towel by the stop netting now so they can towel themselves off between points. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to towel myself off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. In the second half of their fundraising performance for Norwich Cathedral, Simon Callow and Stephen Fry were in conversation on the stage of the city's Theatre Royal. Before the performance, the Bishop of Norwich, the Right Reverend Graham James, invited them to take afternoon tea. After the light-hearted reflections on their careers on the stage in the first half, part two touched on more philosophical subjects at the end of a week in which homosexuality and the church had dominated the headlines. But first, it was my job as theatre director to remind the audience of the great cause they were supporting, before getting Simon and Stephen back on stage. We had a bucket um, <laughs> filled with questions from... Uh, <coughs> oh, very good question here. G- give me yours. Ah, yes. Pablo Barnett uh, of Norwich. Uh, if you could have anyone from history for dinner and drinks, whom would you pick? Winston Churchill chose Oscar Wilde when he was asked that question, uh-huh. which was um, surprised a lot of people who had expected him to say his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, or yes. Wellington or Caesar or something. Yes, yes, yes. <coughs> and obviously Wilde, I mean, it's an obvious answer. Um, but um, it's obvious because uh, there were a few human beings who ever drew breath who had more, uh, more to recommend them as dinner companions. There was a, a, a one dinner table uh, he was at where uh, Lord Alfred Douglas was, uh, was ranting about uh, some young poet, younger than Douglas, who had just been published. And um, uh, Wilde suddenly said, uh, um, the devil was walking one evening in the Libyan desert when he saw a monk being tormented by some junior imps. And he watched for a while and he saw that this monk was holy and steadfast and was not being successfully tempted 
by these young devils. So he approached them and said, what, what is happening here? And they bowed low and they said, Master, for 39 days and 39 nights we have tried to turn this man of God away from his church, away from his Christ, away from his God. We have offered him power and principalities and delights of the flesh, but he has steadfastly refused to be tempted. The devil said, out of the way. He leant forward and whispered in this monk's ear, and the monk ripped the pectoral cross from around his neck, snapped it in twain, tore his holy garments, and shrieked and filled the air with imprecations and curses against his God and church. And the little imps and devils bowed down in front of Satan and said, Truly you are the master. For 39 days and 39 nights we could get nothing from him. You just whisper in his ear and he turns his back against his church. What did you say? The devil says, It was very simple. I merely told him that his brother had been made Bishop of Alexandria. <laughs> <laughs> anyone who can come up with that at a dinner party is surely number one on the list who would you have? he did of course rehearse uh, mm. um, a little bit indeed there's a famous story of him saying goodbye to the is, you know exactly. that story? Yes. Uh, the, 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 the train station uh, well, no, you tell well uh, there's a story he went in fact to Cambridge which was not his uh, natural habitat being an Oxford man uh, and uh, saw some young undergraduates they took him to the station to say goodbye and he said, apparently, he stood at the window and was giving marvellous uh, anecdotes, terrific bombers, uh, wonderful, and they were all delighted and giggling. An announcement was made, uh, the train will be ten minutes late, and Wilde looked rather ashen <laughs> <laughs> and stopped speaking. <laughs> he had rehearsed up until the moment. <laughs> That's, I, I refuse to count. But he also, <laughs> took, he, uh, on his way round London, telling, uh, uh, f from having dinner in one place and joining them for port in another yes, and then even the, the so stories would slowly develop improve. as the evening went yeah. on till by well, the end they, he'd written them to a pitch of perfection and the next day he'd write yes. them down well <laughs> <laughs> this is just a little little remark you were talking about uh, crying when reading Shakespeare and uh, a K. Bion of Norwich uh, his or her stepmother had a saying which was about uh, crying, says, uh, when someone was emotional, their bladder was too near their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was... That's a Norwich saying. Uh, well, actually, <laughs> I wish I could say it were. Apparently it's V. Yorkshire, according to Kate Byron. Oh. <laughs> many, many years ago, in a situation sort of like this, I was interviewing Dustin Hoffman at the, at the National Film Theatre. And... Um, uh, Dustin said that uh, he'd, uh, been, he was sharing a, a room with uh, Robert Duval yeah. all those years ago, years in the 50s, early yeah. 50s, mid 50s. And um, uh, Duval had uh, um, come into his um, uh, room at uh, 2 o'clock in the morning and woken him up and said, There's this guy, you gotta hear him, he's called John Gielgud. You gotta go and hear the guy. He's at the Y. He's doing something called the Ages of Man. You gotta go and hear him. And Dustin said, "No, I don't want to hear him. I know what he's like. He's it's English acting. I don't want to hear it." And Duval said, "If you don't go, I'm gonna smash your head against the wall." <laughs> and so Dustin most reluctantly went to the Y, and he bought his ticket, and he sat in the stalls. They sat in the, there aren't stores, they sat in a rather hard seat in the Y. And Sir John came on and out poured this torrent of, of, of sound and melody, and rhythm. And um, Dustin said that he sat there thinking, This is crap. I hate this. This is English acting. I don't want anything to do with it. It's not real. I don't. But as he was thinking these thoughts, he was aware of an unaccustomed sensation, which was of tears pouring down his face. And I've always been very, I honor him very much for telling that story. But also it, it, it hits a great truth, is that in a sense, great poetry, great drama bypasses the intellect. The reality of theater, as of any art, is that it, it, it isn't a, a, a reproduction of reality at all. It's an extension of it, it's a, it's a recreation of it, a reimagining of it, and its purpose is to reach you at a very, very deep level.
And um, uh, uh, when people criticized John, and, and uh, John Gilgan was occasionally guilty of indulging in sound for its own sake. Yeah. But once he stood on the stage of the old Vic Theatre in one of those extraordinary evenings that one simply can hardly believe one's luck to have seen. It was called a tribute to the lady, the lady in question being Lillian Baylis. Yeah. And on stage were John Gielgud and Peggy Ashcroft and um, uh, Ralph Richardson and, and many other actors who'd appeared in that company. In the stalls were Michael Redgrave and Sybil Thorndike, that mm. huge great spirit at the age of 90 two being wheeled in in a wheelchair and swathed in white silk from head to foot and, and, and turning round knowing that you know people were aware that she was there and turning round saying hello everybody <laughs> <laughs> and um, John Gilgood uh, then came on stage and he just tore into what a rogue and peasant slave am I it, it was as if Shakespeare was there in the room that, that, that the initial impulse that had led Shakespeare to write those words was now flowing through John Gielgud and it was absolutely overwhelming. Now what is your question? Mine says, um, um, it's from Diane Pickett of Beckles. Oh, Suffolk but will allow her. <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are we being geographist about this? Oh, very much. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Stephen, would you like to act in a P.G. Woodhouse play or TV series again, like your role as Jeeves? Well, um, I certainly wouldn't say I wouldn't like to. I enjoyed doing Jeeves and Worcester enormously. Um, it was fantastic fun, and, and Woodhouse was one of my absolute passions when I was young. Um, I wrote to him, and in fact, when we were recording the, uh, uh, the series, filming it around the place, uh, I had his little photograph, which I still have, to Stephen Fry, all the best, P.G. Woodhouse, um, signed photograph, and he wrote me this wonderful letter on his old typewriter, and on that very typewriter that had, had written the Jeeves stories and the Euclid stories and the Blanding stories and all those wonderful stories, um, I got this letter, which was, I was so proud of. I was about 14 or 15, I think, when I wrote it. Uh, that's another small point of contact between us, I, I, that I recorded all the Jeeves books. You did, yeah. Um, uh, on the cassette tape. Uh, and indeed, cassette it, tape. It, and indeed. <laughs> The proper it's, it's you like a judge. <laughs> <laughs> what exactly is a muppet? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you recorded. What are yes. Yes. <laughs> um, But uh, uh, and I, I, I indeed I, I, I must immodestly uh, boast that I won a prize for it uh, uh, with the Did a title you mean a talkie? Is, what a talkie? That's uh, what they're called. I, I think they are called yeah, that. Yeah. But the actual. The category was one that it's very hard to live up to, was Male Performer of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> I've struggled with that one. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, they're waving at us. Are they already? Yes. I would just tell a couple of stories then on the basis of that. <laughs> right. so, um, it just you reminded me of it. Where, um, Sybil Thorndike reminded me of a story someone told me about Lady Tree. Um, a great old actress uh, who was doing a, a charity uh, evening at the Victoria Palace. And she uh, appeared, not swathed in white silk, but in, in, in sort of crinolines and a ruched parasol and, uh, and a large hat. She was to do her comedy sketch. She sat on the stool upstage and said, Now, I want you to imagine that I'm a plumber's mate. <laughs> <laughs> so <I> think, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's unquestionably the way acting should be, I think. <laughs> Now, I have another question. I'm not sure I'm allowed. I, I didn't exactly promise the bishop I wouldn't answer this, but um, it's Andrew and Stuart Rippon uh, of Norwich who want to know our views on the appointment of Bishop John. Uh, <laughs> I could speak around it while you're preparing your thoughts, if you like, which is that uh, um, I wish to stay out of church politics because I just don't have the strength of mind to, to bear the, the insults and cruelty and viciousness that are thrown at people when they discuss things like Episcopal appointments. It's much safer to be in, you know, in an arena like military and uh, warfare and things like that, you know, it's a, it's a lot more comfortable. But I do find it, um, personally, uh, I've always um, had a rather Henry Crawford, you know, the character in uh, Mansfield Park view, that I've, I've always fancied myself as a bishop, and I must mm -hmm. say this in the presence of, you know, I, I think 
you know. Uh, um, and if it were not for, for, a, for a cruel want of faith, I think I would uh, make, <laughs> <laughs> make a damn good bishop. Uh, no, as people say, these can. days it may not get in the way. Uh, I, I, do, <laughs> I, do, I do happen to think uh, Rome Williams is, is an, excellent, uh, an excellent man from, from what I know of him. Uh, you know, obviously, on, on the subject of, uh, of biblical text and examples to why you can't uh, do certain things with your body that you wish to, I, I, I find that um, absolutely absurd. I think uh, uh, I've always been extremely uncomfortable with the idea in any society uh, that, that belief is based on, on uh, revealed truth, that's to say, on, on a text like the Bible or a Quran or whatever it is. It seems to me that the, the, the greatness of our culture, for all its incredible faults, is that we have grown up on the Greek ideal of discovering the truth, discovering by looking around us, by empirical experiment, by uh, the combination of the experience of generations of ancestors who have, who have uh, contributed to our some knowledge of the way the world works and, and so on. And uh, to have that snatched away and to be told what to think by a book however great it may be in places. This is a book that says you can sell your daughter into slavery. It's a book that bans menstruating women from within miles of temples. The fact that it also says that for one man to lie with another is an abomination is no more made relevant or important than the fact that you can't eat shelf shellfish. And if there is anything extraordinary about the figure of Christ, and there is, this is a man who said, you know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone, which is as great a thing as any human being has ever said, you know, it's one of the most remarkable phrases to come from human lips. And if there is anything, as I say, remarkable about that Christ figure, it is that you know he is not the man who would be casting stones under any circumstances whatsoever. That's my answer. It's a curious thing, whenever the subject of homosexuality is raised in, for example, Parliament, mm. or in the press, or in this sort of a context, those of us who are gay feel a most peculiar sense of alienation, when suddenly I become an example, not personally, although sometimes that's true too, of a condition. Uh, 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 an oddity, an abnormality, and there happen to be quite a, a number of people in England, in the world, for whom the very nature of my life is an abomination simply on principle. Yeah. And uh, when I read about the debate over the Bishop of Reading, on the one hand, I'm a little, I'm sort of disappointed. I just think, oh really, are we still having this conversation yeah. at this stage in human history? Is this really still seriously being debated? And then on the other hand, I'm angry. Yeah. And I think, um, I don't want to have anything to do with the people who believe these things. And nobody's actually saying, oh, lynch people at the yeah. moment. They're yeah. not saying kill them or castrate them as they were saying only 30 years ago. Give them shock therapy, castrate them, lock them up. Now they're saying, okay, 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 you're here and you're here to stay, but we won't have you in any prominent position. We won't yeah. allow you, above all, to be associated with the name of God. And that's just a source of I agree. deep melancholy to me. Um, it, I would hope that any faith, any, any organization which was essentially dedicated to the idea of, which I think all religions would claim to be, essentially dedicated to the idea of nurturing the spiritual essence of human life, would wish to include all of human beings. I think one of the, one of the things that um, newspapers, and um, let's face it, we might as well come out and say it if you don't mind swearing on the stage, the Daily Mail, which is the... Uh, uh, <laughs> they... they they very easily whip up stories about how unlikable gay people are, uh, how, uh, how important this is or that is. What, oddly enough, they are the flights of fancy. They're the things that, are, oddly enough, being newspapers, they're the things that are so rarely grounded. They are not connected with the person beaten up in the park because yeah. he looks camp or the immigrant beaten up because they've got an Albanian voice who may actually have lived there for 40 years or whatever. It's these, these extraordinary hatreds. But I do find on that subject... 
the Daily Mail is incredibly useful because you no longer need to know what to think. You just look at the Daily Mail, see what it's saying, and know that the opposite is always true. <laughs> it's fantastically good. Isn't it? <laughs> I will do. We've got the sign saying three, th three minutes here, so we'll, we've got time for a couple more questions. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, this is obviously directed to you, Richard Todd of Norwich. Does extreme intelligence result in happiness? Is ignorance bliss? <laughs> um, uh, Ignorance, I'm sure, is bliss, isn't it? Don't you think? Well, yes, to put that famous quotation in context, it's, yes. uh, it's from Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eaton Chapel by Thomas Gray, isn't it? Yes. Where ignorance is bliss, it is folly to be wise. Yes. Um, wisdom, I think. What do you think about wisdom? That's, that's, the, that's the chap to go for. I, I, do, I do think so, but, it, but it, it's very hard one. Yeah. Uh, and uh, intelligence by no means necessarily guarantees wisdom. No. In fact, it can be the enemy of wisdom. There are a lot of intelligent people who don't know which way to sit on a lavatory, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, you, know, you wouldn't. It's, it's not right that they're using the streets unsupervised. <laughs> I, do you remember the marvellously be eyebrowed um, uh, Ramsey, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury yes, uh, in the 60s? I remember, I remember him being interviewed uh, by a, a, a BBC first thing. Now, um, Your Grace, you have something of a reputation for being uh, wise. Oh, do I? Do I really? <laughs> Am I wise? I wonder. I wonder if I'm wise. Am I wise? I wonder. And um, he, uh, he said, well, Your Grace, uh, what, what would you say wisdom is? He said, wisdom, wisdom. I wonder what it, wisdom is. Hmm. He said, I think it's the ability to cope. Isn't that a wonderful answer? I think it's so spot on. It's you nothing know. to do with book learning. It's nothing to do with, uh, with knowledge or understanding of the laws of the universe. It's nothing yes. to do with necessarily so political sophistication. Yes. Yes. Uh, but it is an ability to cope. And yes. It seems to me it's the best answer I've ever heard. Anyway. Yes, yes. No, I, I, absolutely. I, I, can, I can see that. It, 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 it seems to be some, some, uh, some capacity to, co to uh, convert experience into knowledge. Um, and talking of wisdom, have we got time for... I don't know how we're doing for time, but I'm, I'm having fun at the moment. And obviously, it does storm out when you're bored. <laughs> uh, that, was it that one? Well, I don't think we can actually ask the next question after that, Stephen. Oh, what are your unswerving life philosophies? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my favourite sayings, and corny as it is, was uh, uh, an old don. At, uh, it's reported in most stories at Jesus College, Cambridge, so I like to think of someone like Sir Arthur Quiller Cooch, or someone like that. Um, in, in the 1930s was welcoming a young fellow to the, uh, to the, com to the common room or combination room as they're called and uh, uh, he said welcome, he said welcome, very nice to have you here, he said a word of advice don't try to be clever we're all clever here, <laughs> only try to be kind, a little kind I just think it's a, it's a wonderful thing, kind is such a small word compared to virtue and mercy and justice and grace and all the, the capital letter words of the, of the, of the Victorians. Um, but I think it's perhaps the strongest, it's the, it's the drip of water that really erodes the rock, is kindness. I think kindness is, is it's not a philosophy exactly, but uh, it's, as, it's as good a lodestar to try to follow as any other. What do you think, sir? Well, I... The Kindly answer quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I just simply, wherever one can, wherever I, whenever I can, I try to turn negative energy into positive energy. And it's, it, it, it's, it, it's extraordinarily easy in oneself and in relation to the outside world to allow energy to turn bad, as it were. Yes. And if you always, if one always just tries to convert something yes. into something which is life enhancing rather than life suppressing, then yes. I suppose one's yes. done something worth doing. Well, you always know wherever Simon is, if you're in a restaurant or in the <laughs> corridors of the BBC, because you hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as good a way to live your life. I think, uh, I think we have to be done. We have to let yes. you all go. And we have to let ourselves go too, to some extent. Thank you all so much. We must say goodbye. <laughs>